Binge the full week of The Ray Taylor Show ad free over at inspireddisorder.com slash plus. This is The Ray Taylor Show. Welcome to The Ray Taylor Show, where I bring you the reviews of the latest movies and TV shows, as well as classic and foreign films. I'm your host, Ray Taylor, and on this podcast, I'll be talking about all things film and television. Whether you're looking for a new show to binge or want to know if that blockbuster is worth the trip to the theater, or just want to hear my thoughts on a classic or a foreign film, I've got you covered. So join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for new episodes, and let's dive into the world of film and television together on today's episode i am talking about another new release came out this year 2023 entitled salt burn this is written and directed by emerald Fennell, starring barry Keoghan and jacob elordi in this movie a student at oxford university finds himself drawn into the world of a charming and aristocratic classmate who invites him to his eccentric family's sprawling estate for a summer never to be forgotten. I had heard mixed reviews and opinions of this film, uh, but I'm a fan of both Barry Keoghan uh, from Killing of a Sacred Deer, Banshees of Inishirin, uh, among other things I've seen him in. I think he's probably been in other stuff recently. Uh, as well as well as uh, Jacob Elordi, which I, I think I've only seen him in Euphoria, but he's great in Euphoria. I've heard other things that he's great in as well, thought he was great in this. Um, and I have enjoyed the writer-director, Emer- Emerald Fennell's previous film, Promising Young Woman. So I was looking forward to this film. Writer, director, actors... Turns out this is a divisive film. Not everybody liked it. This is kind of a love-hate movie. Uh, And I was also curious to see which side of that love-hate opinion I would land on, right? As this being a divisive film, let's let's go. Let's see. Because, you know, even though I don't like to watch films that are bad, uh, I do kind of enjoy, uh, you know... I, I, you know, if, if if it's like a popular movie, a controversial movie, I should say, uh, where there's a lot of love for it and a lot of hate for it, it's always curious to see. Uh, it's always worth a shot, especially a movie like this that's kind of high profile in a lot of ways. Uh, and I got to say, I love this movie. <laughs> that's where I landed on it. I love this movie. It, it, you know, this in some ways tapped into kind of a very similar uh, vibe and, and reasons why I love the film Triangle of Sadness. I think they are very different films, but I think they kind of tap into the a, a thing that I enjoy to see on screen. Um, and even, I love this movie so much, it might make my top five of the year, which I said that about Maestro as well, the movie I reviewed on Monday. And now I'm saying it about this movie, and I still haven't watched. There's probably ten movies that are probably in consideration of being on my top five. So I don't know how my top five list of the year is going to shake out, but this is definitely a contender. That's how much I love this movie, right? There's still a bunch of movies, as I said, that I still need to, uh, to check out. Um, but I can also see how people didn't like this movie. I can, I can see that. I, you know, I, there, I saw some, real hate for this movie i don't understand people that viscerally hate this movie as i have seen reaction for i think you know there's definitely movies out there that can elicit some some hate but uh this movie in particular i i didn't hate it i mean even if even though i can tell i can i can understand why somebody wouldn't like it uh I can't understand, like I could, I would still expect maybe some understanding or respect for why people do like it. Regardless, I love this movie. So I, I I just don't understand the people. But that's the thing about art, art subjective, not every movie, the very controversial opinion I had about, uh, the, the more recent film, another recent film that I really love that might be on my top five list, leave the world behind. Uh, a movie that I've gotten a lot of comments, people absolutely not liking, uh, but I loved that movie. So, you know, sometimes movies just hit different people in different ways, and I can understand that. I don't get, 
I don't get upset if people uh, hate movies that I love uh, because I love them so I can watch them again and enjoy them again and they can just find whatever they like and that's fine too. Let's take a short break from this episode. Listeners, if you're an art lover like I am or simply somebody who appreciates unique creativity, I've got something you'll adore. Dive into the world of The Many Faces, an ongoing series of mesmerizing ink paintings on paper. Each piece is a captivating blend of abstract and surreal, always presenting a face that tells its own story. The dedication behind this series is unmatched, with new paintings being released daily. And if you're thinking about owning one, you're in luck. You can start with a 4 by 6 inch painting for just $20. And if you desire something grander, there are large sizes available with prices to match. Imagine having an original piece of art infused with emotion and mystery gracing your space. So if you're intrigued, don't wait. Check out the entire collection and get your own at InspiredDisorder.com. Own a piece of creativity that truly stands out. Now let's get back to the show. The one thing I didn't necessarily like or that was unnecessary for this film is the aspect ratio. It's got a four by three aspect ratio, which I don't uh, I don't understand. I understand why a lot of films like the movie I reviewed earlier, Maestro, understand why that might be filmed in four by three. I understand why films like The Lighthouse are, are filmed in like a, a different aspect was kind of more a square aspect ratio. I can understand that kind of suits the the time and what film looked like. But this movie just like I want to watch this movie full screen, right? Having black bars on the sides of this movie did nothing to help this movie in any way. Uh, it didn't. I mean, it's not a film where you f need to feel claustrophobic in any way. Uh, it just it you have gorgeous uh, place like the setting this movie takes place. Saltburn itself would have loved to see it in full. Like it's a beautiful film. I don't understand the aspect ratio of this film, uh, but that's the only real aspect of this movie I, I didn't really like. The acting I thought was great. Right, I've only seen Barry Keoghan and Jacob Elordi in a few things, as I mentioned, but they are great in everything I've seen them in. Uh, so great performances here. Barry specifically. I love Barry Keoghan's style, which you see uh, is clearly different characters. His character in, in, in a Sharon is different from uh, is different from Killing of a Sacred Deer, which is different from this. But he definitely has his own very unique style, right? All of his characters, you really get the feeling and the sense that the character is like thinking and processing things. And in this movie, it's really not noticeable because he's a character who is clearly smart, right? This movie opens, I'll get to spoilers, but this movie opens with him establishing that he did all of the the uh reading on his reading list that he before he even got to class that semester which he didn't need to do and it was only uh it wasn't mandatory reading so it's like he clearly establishes that he's an overachiever he's at this school because he got a scholarship or at least you know so and you see that he doesn't he keeps his cards close to his vest let's just put it that way and that's all in his performance, why, which I, I particularly uh, appreciate, his, his unique performance. Um, you know, and all of his performance, very strange in the, all their own ways, right? Kind of usually kind of a sad character, uh, maybe pathetic in some, in some scenes or at least moments of being pathetic. Uh, and I think this film plays with that aspect of his previous films, like kind of plays into what you may think of him and his character coming into this um from the beginning of this film you know as i said he's a character he's smart bit of an overachiever uh but also allows people to assume he's less than a quip he, that he's not as smart or like he l allows people to assume whatever they want about him and in a lot of situations he takes advantage of their assumptions uh, which I appreciate it as well, right? In this film, 
It's a film that explores kind of the mentalities as well of wealthy people, people that come from quote unquote old money, the facade of niceness and politeness that they they have, right? Being very different in very different situations, never really being open and honest fully, always having this this uh, this fake veneer of being polite and nice but you see you see cracks in that and you see when the veil is dropped how they act behind people's backs and also what that does to people who are raised uh to act that way people who are generationally like just kind of indoctrinated into this way of being into being fake on the front and a different person like always hiding who you really are to put on this show of of like royalness of wealth right right acting as if they are above humanity's problems they don't really they you know humans normals normies they do this thing but we are civilized we are polite, civilized society. That is why we. That's why God has bestowed us with this this wealth because we are civilized and not scoundrels, right? A- abiding by a dress code for dinner and somehow unaffected by the human condition as well, and their systems of living in their castle, which is. You know, it's not just an estate. This is, I mean, it's its a small castle that these people live in. But you, in this movie, also, the fraud isn't only present in the wealthy, right? This dishonesty, this, this, this lying, right? This movie explores lies and deception and manipulation in many forms, which is another aspect I enjoy. Very complicated, unlikable characters for a lot of different reasons, right? As Oliver, who is an outsider of this family, Barry Kugan's character, like clearly trying to fit in, right? The fake it till you make it type of facade that some people can put on. Trying to pretend like you belong, like you have been, like you belong with the privileged. The people that have never understood suffering. Who have never had to like struggle (laughs) these are the the true the true like privilege of wealth is never having to worry about being homeless or being without food or being without anything you could ever want at the snap of a finger which is the way these people live and you have everyone speaking half truths and pretending to be genuine, right? This film builds to some really great moments because of that. Moments where tragedy happens, but also moments where people's true nature shines through. Even after it seems they have been exposed, you don't see it all. Like there are layers to the, the manipulation and the deception. I also love this film for its kind of sexual fluidity, right? The emotions of love and lust and desire are all big elements in this film. And letting those emotions be open regardless of gender or even age. It makes for a more unexpected outcome, all of those those aspects, as well as some very intense, interesting scenes as well like this is a this is a very sexual movie in a lot of ways let's take a short break from this episode listeners let me paint you a picture imagine owning a piece of art that's not only visually striking but also exclusive dive deep into the world of the many faces a series that's now available as high quality limited edition prints each piece captures the essence of abstract and surreal beauty making it a perfect conversation starter for your space. What makes these prints even more special? They're all hand-signed and numbered by the artist, me. Adding that personal touch 
of authenticity. And the best part, you don't need to break the bank to own one. Starting at just $5 for a 4 by 6 inch size, with sizes and prices that scale up, giving you options to suit your space and your budget. Art collectors, enthusiasts, or anyone who loves unique pieces, this is your chance. Elevate your walls and own a piece of limited edition artistry. Head on over to InspiredDisorder.com and secure your exclusive print today. Now let's get back to the show. But I do want to talk about spoilers. I want to talk about specifics of this film, moments that I really liked, aspects of this film that really stood out to me. But I don't want to spoil it for anybody that hasn't seen it yet. It is available to stream. I forget which streaming service I saw it, but it is available. So I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed it. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so maybe if we're aligned, if our tastes in film are aligned, then you will like this one. But uh, if you haven't watched it, I'd, I, this is a movie that has spoilers. This is a movie that has twists. This is a movie that, that, that changes and there's revelations that happen. So if you don't want those spoiled, this is your warning. Uh, but the film... We are. It's all like kind of take you through my process watching this film because it's like I had thoughts on scenes that happened, and later on those scenes take on new meaning as we get more information. So I want to kind of just run through my thought process as if, right, uh, take you along my journey watching this film, right? And when we're first introduced to Oliver Barry Kugan's character. Right, you see that he's an overachiever. He's having a meeting. He read all the books before school even started, but not really a pushover when this other student comes in to try and criticize one of his like book reports or whatever, one of the things that he wrote, criticizing the way he wrote about the way he criticized it rather than the substance of his critique. Right. So right off the bat, you know Oliver is a smart dude. Right. Book smart. Right. And later on, we find out this dude's street smart as well. Well, I guess right away we kind of see that he's both right. He's book smart, but he's street smart in that he's always playing his cards close to his vest. Like he's not he's he allows people to assume whatever they want about him. And he uses that to his advantage. So he's he's uh, he's intelligent in both ways. All right, very intelligent character and kind of these characteristics that you see in this first scene, really. You know, these you kind of understand. But does seem to go out of his way to be nice, it seems, or at least it seems that way, like that he's kind of naive, right? Giving this guy that he likes, right? He's got a, an effectuate, effectuate, in fact, in fact, he's super turned on to, he really likes uh, Felix, infatuation did i say that right man uh he has an infatuation with felix uh played by jacob lordy and he you know he has a flat tire on his bike and uh and oliver gives him his bike and offers to walk uh felix's bike back to school for him right really going out of his way to be nice to a guy that doesn't even know who he is right but he likes him clearly likes him so, which that scene we gets recontextualized later, but still is a scene where it's like this guy, Oliver, likes Felix and he is actively pursuing Felix, right? Going out of his way to try and get on his good side, right? And instantly turns his back on this, the one friend, the one person that when he first started at this school accepted him because they were both outcasts and immediately when oliver gets the opportunity to uh, become friends with felix and his friend group being kind of welcomed into that friend group immediately turns his back on this guy so it shows that oliver is not only right uh kind of out to try and improve his status right doing what he can to get his want what he wants right he has he's clear about what he wants and will use people to achieve those means not that he really used this this friend of his uh but definitely left him stranded right when he 
became one of the cool kids, right? So it definitely shows Oliver's character that he's not a great guy, that, you know, he's shallow in his pursuit of Felix. Uh, and you see that he's poor, right? That is the story that he is, you know, telling these friends and, you know, that he's kind of, he, you know, he's a scholarship. That's how he got into school. He doesn't have money, right? They're at the bar. He can't afford to buy a round of drinks. Um, and Felix helps him out, right? Seeing that he's going to be embarrassed. Felix, nice guy, trying to help him out. And at the same time, Felix has never known what money is has never had to work for money, has never had to worry about where money might come from because his fun, his family is like wealthy, generational wealth. They live in a castle, right? So, you know, he it's not a big gesture for this guy to buy, t- to pay for Ollie's round of uh, drinks at the bar, right? But, of course, for Ollie, it's a big thing. But it shows how nice Felix is, right? But also Felix is kind of naive to the real world because he has never had to struggle for anything. Not only the fact that he is a gorgeous man, right? He's attractive, but he's also comes from wealth. So it's like he's never had to struggle. He's never... Like, he's never been looked down upon by any aspect of society necessarily, right? He has at his disposal at any moment, whenever he feels like it, any woman he wants, he can just point and that will be the woman that will go with him. Not only because he's attractive, but also because he's wealthy and they're not every woman are attracted to those things, but that is a... A, a a double double threat that many women would love either aspect of those things so he is a young attractive wealthy man and has his selection of gorgeous women to choose from right so he's not he's not somebody that's ever liked a girl and ever even contemplated that she would say no and if there ever was there are 10 other women who will say yes, right? So he's never had to struggle, right? And people go out of their way to be nice to him because they know he's wealthy, because they want, you know, there's the yes men. It's like any famous person's entourage, right? They're all yes men. They're not gonna, They're not going to be real with you. So that's why... Felix likes Oliver because Oliver is real, right? And and Felix only knows fake. His whole family is fake. The way he was raised is to be a fake person, to have a facade and to talk shit behind, behind people's backs, right? So he likes, he's using Oliver as a way to get in touch with real people. But he has to, you know, he's like he never has to worry about studying. Like being at school is just a formality for him. He doesn't have to do anything. He could never, he would never have to work. The wealth of this family could fund a village of people that would never have to work. But it's hoarded in one in one family, right? He has no concept of what Ollie's life is like to come from poverty have a a parents dealing with mental illness and addiction has never known what it's like to not be able to afford a round of booze at the pub right this family of his being a massive burden at least that's what we think about oliver's family because that's what he's told us he's poor his parents have addiction mental illness his dad is eventually going to pass away through the course of this Right. And the idea of going home for Oliver is so far removed from what it's like for Felix to go home. Right. If Oliver truly lived in poverty, parents have serious addiction problems, drug addiction, uh, crime, like to go home to that is a very different thing than Felix going home to his estate with his family. 
uh, very different things. And Felix has no comprehension of what any other type of life is like. And then you have this cousin of Felix who's a complete asshole, right? He's basically won a lottery ticket. His, like, step mom or his mom was rela- is related to the family and the family when she died or whatever took him in. So he is now p- part of the family. Although kind of an outcast of the family, he's mixed race, uh, Archie. But uh, still doesn't have to worry about money. Somebody that no may have understood what life is like on the outside, but now has the privilege and fl- and flaunts it as opposed to Felix. Like there's definitely a different mentality between Archie and and uh, and uh, Felix. Wait, isn't his name Archie or is it Farley? I might be giving him the wrong name. That might be the actor's name. Regardless, you know, uh, it's another dynamic, this cousin. Very interesting. Um, And Saltburn, not just a mansion. It's basically a castle. And everyone in the family pities Oliver behind his back, right? Talking about him, his family acting like they have an idea of what hard life is like, what addiction and drug addiction is like, like as, as if they have any, any idea. And, uh, when they finally meet him, like you get to see the, the characteristics, the mom, uh, Elspeth has a horror of ugliness right this is how privileged this woman is she is horrified by ugly people or ugliness in general and has been able to live a life of such privilege that she never has to be in the presence of ugliness right she's she's always had the option to just kind of pick and choose what surrounds her that is the type of life life elspeth has just but then also a very sweet lady like be very nice to oliver but like that first lo- that first line that she says where she has a horror of ugliness she was worried that oliver might be ugly and that that would be a problem for her because she can't stand to be around ugly really shows a lot about that person it really shows that her niceness is just is literally skin deep as long as you're attractive she will approach you as a human being if you are not up to her standards of beauty then you should be banished from her surroundings because she is horrified it is a horror of ugliness for her but also trying to sympathize with Oliver while also kind of interviewing him about his mom because, you know, they don't know. So they don't know that, you know, digging into such a a delicate situation about, like, your parents' alcoholism or mental health, like, that's kind of very, like, oh, we just met and you want to know how horrible my parents are doing? And the dress code for dinner, they have to dress in black tie for dinner. And, of course, Oliver sees through how fake all of them are, like, instantly. You can tell that he's, like, he's sizing them all up, right? And to them, he's just kind of a curiosity. For Felix, he's he's trying to pretend like he is a normal person because he has a normal friend. Like Oliver is just this this novelty for this family. And he's not the first novelty, the first quote unquote real person that Felix has brought home. Right? That this he's just that's that's the placeholder. Oliver is the placeholder for a normal person so they can feel like they're doing good 
they're good people for like allowing this normal person into their life. And throughout this, there's a lot of fun montages of these kids just having a great time this summer at this castle, right? Playing tennis with suits on, uh, laying naked in the field, swimming in ponds. It's like uh, this great montage of just these kids having fun, right? These college kids having fun. Everybody is seemingly reading Harry Potter, which I thought was kind of a funny, like <laughs> these, all of these people that should be reading higher level education books are just reading Harry Potter. Um, meanwhile, Oliver is studying books that were written about the Saltburn Castle, right? In order to kind of impress the dad, right? Kind of like, oh, like I know what this antique stuff is. I know like the artists that created these things. Like really trying to uh, butter up to the dad, which just again shows how smart Oliver is than all of them, right? And kind of him playing them to his advantage through the summer. And he is even aware that he is only a, a temporary amusement for them, right? Like he is aware of that he's being used, but he is as well, he is using them without them knowing i mean they may t to one extent like the the cousin probably assumes that that's what he's doing but he doesn't know the real he doesn't know really what he is what he's doing um and then there's some like crazy scenes right they they have a uh, him and felix oliver and felix they share, share a bathroom between their two rooms and oliver's w watching felix jerk off in the bath and then going when the bath water is draining, kind of going into like in this very like romantic, very hot scene of him licking this cum water as it goes down the drain and licking the drain as if it's uh, an orifice of uh, somebody that he is getting down with. Um, and I, I, like I said, the sexuality of this film, the fluidity of it especially with Oliver, I enjoy. It adds such an interesting dynamic to everything. Right? And also, not only to show his desire for Felix, but also his desire for that life. Like, he is kind of, he's enjoying what this life, like, he is appreciating what this privilege can be for him. And even he, he hits on the mom in a very, you know, in the very next scene, right? You have him, like, giving a rim job to this bathtub and then cut to he's hanging out with the mom during, like, sunset or whatever in the very next scene. And while his mom is talking about her daughter, right, because this is the fake niceness of this family this mom talking about her daughter being a slut ever since she found out she was infertile and then also having bulimia like just saying very private hurtful things about her daughter to this guy that is there for the summer to oliver right clearly has no boundaries has no respect for her daughter and he uses that as an opportunity to tell her that it must be hard on her because her mom is so fucking beautiful, right? Thro just throwing the seed of that he is attracted to the mom. And that kind of takes her aback, kind of like catches her off guard. But the seed has been planted. It's a very interesting scene. Coming back later. Um, and then he starts playing them against each other, right? Because he... He understands the dynamics between them, and he just starts off. And, of course, the cousin is the easiest one to to mess with, right? And then there's the scene where kind of things, we start to see the facade of Oliver start to get peeled away. Where Felix, on Oliver's birthday, tells him they're going on a road trip and ends up taking him to go see his mom on his birthday. Which, at first, knowing the reality of the movie at that point thinking that Oliver comes from a poor family of mental illness. 
and addiction and his dad had just died if somebody did that to me like fraudulently took me kidnapped me to take me to my mom's house after i've explicitly stated this is not good i do not want to do this like I, that's that is a fucked up situation but then when we see the reality of barry's life it's it like it like was the first of like oh, okay there is even more to this oliver character like we are seeing only the tip of the iceberg with this character right and at first i hated felix for him doing it and then you know just how inappropriate it would be but then you realize that you know oliver when it's happening he's like oh maybe he really doesn't want to do it because he's lying about it and of course you see as they pull up to the house this nice house in suburbs his mom is super sweet his dad is not dead and is in the backyard just kind of excited to see his son on his birthday and like finding out that he's not an only child like felix finding out that everything about oliver that he's told him is fake and changes their dynamic from this point on uh but the family's gonna throw this birthday party for oliver so they go back to the mansion they go back to the castle and the birthday party is insane like the you know costumes and just obviously it's a, a castle so it's like these giant rooms of all these hundreds of people that are there and the the giant like lawn and and like the estate like the maze and all the different things it's just like a crazy birthday party for him and it's so tragic when they are singing him happy birthday and the part where you say the name of the person whose birthday it is and every single person in the mansion, in the castle, singing Oliver's happy birthday song, none of them know his name. And it is such a heartbreaking scene. Such a heartbreaking scene to know that, like, just how fake everything is. That's what this movie is. It's about a bunch of fake people. Not only Oliver, but everybody else. Everybody that's at that party that is just there because it's this castle party, the family that lives in Saltburn, all fake people. Like, everything is so fake. And when you see the cracks, them not knowing his name is a crack in the facade of bullshit. It's just so sad. And it's like, it's it's hard I have less sympathy for Oliver at this point because I know that he lied about his family. But it's still sad, right? It's not as sad as if he did come from poverty, but it's, you know, it, the 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 sympathy that I have has been lessened because uh, he, he is also a very untruthful person. Um, and then things start to fall apart, which is like, oh, okay. Like, he's turning up this... Like, things start to go bad. Tragedy befalls a family. Hardship befalls a family uh, that has not had to deal with struggle. They are struggling now when Felix is found dead the next morning uh, in the middle of the maze. Right? And, of course, as true to this family pretending like nothing is wrong, this facade goes up and they tell them we need to go eat breakfast they find this dead body and they're like we should just go eat breakfast and have somebody deal with this right they they don't even like allow themselves they're so out of touch with reality and human emotions that they want to just go to eat breakfast and act like their son felix is not lying dead in the middle of this maze which is kind of like the dark humor of this movie kind of comes through as the police keep getting lost trying to find him in the maze. Then them wanting to, the butler wanting to close the curtains so the family can continue to not acknowledge, to keep pretending that nothing bad has happened. 
and him struggling to even close the curtains. Like there's some dark while the room is lit red because these red curtains and the sun pounding through them. It is just darkly funny. And then you have the funeral where after the funeral, well after the ca casket's been put in the ground, covered with dirt, everybody's long gone, gone back to the castle, and Oliver is there alone at the gravesite of Felix. Him fucking the dirt on Felix's grave was another scene similar to the bathtub scene where it's like, man, this guy, like, you can see how kind of unhinged Oliver is. And also kind of the 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 uh, desire he had for Felix, whether it be uh, legitimate or, you know, I mean, it could just be a selfish desire that he had for Felix. Uh, a very profound scene. Let's just put it that way. Uh, then you have more tragedy and you almost have like this rolling kind of thing of like them funeral after funeral after the sister kills herself. Uh, and I love the end. I really love the end, even though kind of you see it all coming and you see that he's, he's like definitely responsible. Like he's manipulating these situations to happen. Like, he probably manipulated a situation for Felix to OD or whatever. You the, manipulated the situation of the clearly when the, the cousin gets, like, expelled from the, the castle because he was trying to auction off a piece, that one of the antiques. Like, it was clear that, I, I felt it was clear that Oliver was in charge of that, but we didn't really get clarification of that until the end. He like, didn't really get cl clarification of how much Oliver had in the deaths, the destruction of this family. Whether it's seeing him po put the poison in the drink that he gave to Felix, whether it's leaving the, the razor blades by Annabelle's bathtub, whether it's uh, seeing actually him grab Archie's phone after he gave him a little handy to to make it so it it's his he email tied to the eBay account right all of the things that the puncturing the tire when he first kind of met Felix how it all comes together and him owning Saltburn I thought was amazing I really liked it his naked dance through Saltburn after it is all his and they're all gone is just like it's so good and despite knowing oliver was manipulating the situations to get close to felix uh to see the end and how much manipulation he did throughout this from purposely flattening his tire to actually having money in his wallet at the pub when he was uh pretending not to have money to buy a round of drinks acting broke to the clarification of him, you know, uh, setting up the cousin, poisoning Felix, leaving the razor blades for Annabelle. It was a whole other level of manipulation, right? This long game <clears throat> that he had having to wait for the father to finally die uh, and to have plant planted the seed with the mom that he was attracted to her so that later on when she sees him all grown up, she invites him to go back to the castle with her and then eventually you know her signing over the castle to him you know i love a movie where a wealthy family loses that that's why i think this movie has similarities to a uh, triangle of sadness uh seeing wealthy people struggle and and deal with horrific things is is a delight to me uh even though oliver himself as an evil person uh you know finding out he came from a nice family and wasn't really struggling kind of made me lose a lot of sympathy uh but i still love seeing the castle crumble as it were castle saltburn the family of saltburn is very much like the fall of the house of usher uh one by one uh they were cursed by oliver uh for no more than just being their privileged family self and you know him 
having the opportunity to take advantage of it. Uh, you know, uh, it was a family that was just insulated from real life and they got a dose of hardship in the biggest way, right? A small dose kind of actually of what the poor people of this country struggle or of any country struggle with, uh, overdoses, suicides, crime, being scammed out of everything you own, right? Real tragedy people actually have to deal with. And for the first time, this this insulated family had to uh, were confronted with this and uh, crumbled, as all families do. Um, but, you know, maybe they should have just chosen to not fall apart. Uh, and it's a family who, after their friend Pamela died, acting like nothing happened, the same as when their son died, and even going to the, the, the point where they commented that she would do anything for attention. That she like died for attention. That's their mentality when their friend of the family, Pamela. Oh dear Pamela, who was living with them when they first showed up. The, the complete lack of humanity that this family had. So I don't really have sympathy for them. And really enjoyed uh, seeing what Oliver did. Right? They finally couldn't ignore the tragedy, even though they tried. They tried so desperately, and they couldn't. Ignoring it did nothing. Uh, just as ignoring the tragedies of what's happening in this country aren't going to fix anything. right? Putting poor people and homeless people in prisons aren't going to fix anything. Just because rich people don't have to see them anymore doesn't mean that tragedy isn't constantly happening. And they're ignoring this in this microcosm of a situation. Them trying to ignore the devastation of what's going on around them did nothing. Not a single person in that family is responsible for their wealth. They, uh, they, it's not like they were rags to riches. right? They're all privileged from birth and have never known struggle. So I have no sympathy for people in those situations. They're privileged. They should be thankful that they are in those situations and don't have to understand what struggle is. But for me and the rest of the people who actually do the work, uh, I don't have I, I don't care if they fall apart because they've done nothing to help humanity. Bringing one person they think they is poor into their house into their house uh, is not what they could actually do to help people. Uh, right. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So in this movie, Oliver is my friend. Oliver is my hero. Uh, and that's why I like this movie. Right. Thank I, and I want to thank everybody for tuning into this episode of the Ray Taylor show. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on Saltburn. Don't forget to tune in every Monday, Wednesday and Friday for more movie and TV show reviews and join the conversation by leaving a comment or rating on your favorite podcast platform or over on youtube.com slash inspired disorder. Until next time, enjoy the show. Subscribe to The Ray Taylor Show on YouTube and everywhere podcasts are found. Binge the full week ad-free over at inspireddisorder.com slash plus. Purchase Ray Taylor Show merch over at inspireddisorder.com. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Peace. Out. Today is the day where you wake up and you realize that everything that you've been dreaming about, everything that you've been wanting, every goal and wish and hope that you've ever had can become real. Dreams can come true. What you manifest in your mind, you can bring to reality.